So I tell people the freedom that MSR has, which is you can come here and be whatever you want. If you want to be a developer, just like building a product, yes, you can be that. If you want to be an entrepreneur, literally running startup, like thinking about the business value of things, you can be that. And if you want to be an academic person, absolutely, you can be that as well. Here's a place that you could come to and choose what you want to be. And you can keep switching what you are as you progress your career here. And isn't that amazing? You're listening to the Microsoft Research Podcast, a show that brings you closer to the cutting edge of technology research and the scientists behind it. I'm your host, Gretchen Huizinga. Dr. Lennon Ravindranath Sivalingam is a researcher by trade, but by nature, he's an entrepreneur and a hacker with a heart of gold. It's this combination of skill and passion that informs his work at Microsoft Research, driving him to discover and build tools that will make life both easier for developers and better for end users. Today, Dr. Sivalingam tells us why he is so passionate about what he does, explains how internships can literally change your life, and shares the story of how a hackathon idea turned into a prize-winning project and then became the backbone of a powerhouse tool for gamers and their fans. That and much more on this episode of the Microsoft Research Podcast. Lenin Ravindranath Sivilingam. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. You're a researcher in systems and networking at MSR. What gets you up in the morning? What are the big questions you're trying to answer and the big problems you're trying to solve? I'm a researcher in the systems and networking here, and my research focus actually spans across the stack, if you think about any systems, even from like mobile to cloud applications. I think a lot about the developers who develop these applications. You know, how do you make their life really easy? What is kind of the hard challenges that they face? So if you look at a developer lifecycle, they have to build the application, they have to test the application, they have to deploy it, and your job is not done yet. You have to monitor it and iterate on it. Mm. So how do you make each stage of the pipeline really easy for developers? Very specific challenges that you have to tackle. One thing I noticed when we talked before is that you're incredibly passionate about the work you do. What makes you so passionate about the systems and networking research and why is it important to you? I think at heart, I'm like a hacker. Uh, (laughs) So that's how I was brought up. So I was like a programmer and a developer at heart. So a lot of the problems I try to solve in my research are very close to my heart. The kind of challenges that I face when I'm trying to build a big system, I'm trying to solve a consumer problem. I'm a developer. I want to spend like three months building this, right? The kind of challenges I face, I bring that back into my research. So The next developer who comes in and who wants to build similar things, I want to make their life really, really easy. So I think that's where the passion comes from because the problems are so close to the heart. So you mentioned your focus is on two main areas of research interest, and your primary interest is developer productivity tools. Let's talk about your work for developers. Tell us how and why you got interested in that line of research and what you want to accomplish. Absolutely. I think last 10 years, even through my grad school, every one of my projects kind of focused on, you know, a developer-centric perspective of things. How do you make it easy for developers to do a certain task? In grad school, I focused a lot on, you know, mobile developers. That was a time Android was coming up, iPhone was coming up, mobile developers were coming up. There were lots of new challenges we could actually go and solve. I think after I came to Microsoft, I shifted my focus towards the cloud. How do people build cloud scale applications, right? So what are the challenges in building those applications? Today, if you want to build a cloud application, it has many different components, okay? Even a very simple application. You want to build a note-taking application where you store something in the database and show it to people later. You have to build a front end. You have to build some sort of storage. And if you want to authenticate the users, you contact some authentication provider. So lots of components off the bat that you have to start, even for a very simple application. Of course, cloud applications are typically built in a way that they are very highly concurrent. So building cloud scale application is challenging. And worse, the place where these applications run, which is your data centers, are kind of fault prone. Your network could be slow. Your VMs could reboot. The external provider that you're contacting is not available. So you have to account for them. Today, it's very hard for developers, to be very frank. 
So I kind of go after those problems. Mm. I take like a specific instance of a problem. I built an application. I'm going to put it in the cloud. I'm not sure where it's going to break, right? <laughs> so how do you enable them, give them the insight during their testing process that these bad things can happen? Sure. So that you can address it up front before putting it out. Because after you put it out, you have like not many chances, okay? If a person comes to your application and it's not available for the next two hours, you're going to drive them away. So you have to be very careful in addressing these bugs before putting it in production. You talk about the four stages of the development life cycle, right? Test, deploy, monitor. Talk in general about the spectrum of research, if you can, that's going on to make it easier for developers to tackle that at various stages of the cycle, particularly as it relates to the cloud now. I'm pretty sure, you know, if you ask different people, there are different number of stages. <laughs> so from <laughs> my perspective, based on a lot of developers I've talked to and me being a developer, I categorize them at a high level to four stages. Sure. You have an idea and you build the application. That's kind of the first stage. Once you build it, you do some form of testing to make sure that you don't break it. And of course, the third stage is it's running in your desktop. So I call that kind of the deployment stage. And we will talk about the challenges there. Sure. And finally, of course, you have deployed your application. As I said, your job is not done you have to monitor it, yeah. how it's doing, right? With respect to your customers in terms of performance, is it handling failures and all of that. So those are kind of the four stages. And I'll maybe drill a little, little bit deeper into each of these stages. And, would you? Yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. And talk about the high-level problems. So in the building part of the stage, of course, I think the trend where it is going right now is you want to make it extremely easy for developers to build their applications. Once they come up with an idea, I want to put three, four libraries together. I want to mix and match in a certain way and have my application ready in a couple of days, yeah. right? So that's the trend with which even Microsoft is going. Lots of other companies are going, right? So you provide these really high-level libraries that can tackle everything for you so that all that you need to come up with is an idea. Yeah. And in that area, I've worked quite a bit, of course. There, how the research area looks like is you take a particular domain where you know, this is a very storage-centric application where the performance of storage should be, you know, really, really fast and reliable and all of that. So how do you abstract that to the developer? How do you provide tools to the developer so that they don't have to worry about these things? Even if it's extremely storage-centric, they don't have to worry about performance, reliability. And cost is, of course, a big issue today when you want to deploy something in the cloud, right? right. So there are specific domains that we have taken. We'll talk about video analytics too, yeah. right, at some point. If you want to build an application that does video analysis, if you take the developer-centric perspective, how do I mix and match a few DNNs from here and there and put them together and run them efficiently? And there I have an application for a domain. Right. So that's kind of the build part of the stage where you want to kind of build tools that abstracts to the highest level possible. And then, of course, comes the test part of the stage, which is absolutely my favorite part of the stage because a lot of developers just ignore it. <laughs> I talk to so many developers and testing is the last thing that they want to think Why? about. Why do you think that is? It's kind of a very non-gratifying process, ah. I guess. The creativity process is what is gratifying. You thought about something and you created something is very gratifying, right? Testing is sort of something that you have to do so that you retain your customers. And that makes it, you know, a very low-hanging fruit for doing research. You know the developer mentality that they don't want to spend a lot of effort in testing systems so how do you make things as automatic as possible? You take an application, you press three buttons, seven hours later, it says you have all these kinds of bugs. That is the vision with which I tackle the testing research area. And we'll talk about some specific projects in there, which is one of my yeah, favorite yeah, yeah. and recent projects, which getting like widely deployed in Microsoft. Right. So that's kind of the testing stage. And of course, there is this big deploying stage when it comes to actually cloud scale applications. Not necessarily actually a big stage in mobile application and on other domains. So the deployment stage is very crucial in cloud scale applications because you have a lot of choice. Okay. Right. So when I actually go to Azure, it gives me, you know, 300 different VMs that I can deploy. If I make a mistake, I pay probably 10x more cost than I should have <laughs> paid, right? So that's a really hard process for developers. They either underspend and actually hit some 
limits in terms of scalability or people are over provision today right so how do you make them optimally you know both spend their resources and cost is a very crucial problem which i've looked at in the past yeah and finally monitoring the application right monitoring is not very different from testing by the way the big problem there is you have to kind of scalably monitor an application and when you find a bug what kind of feedback do you give the developer so that they can fix it very quickly if i just monitor and say yeah this customer came in and the request failed it's not enough so the rich area that is you know root causing the problems i'm monitoring an application it failed but give a feedback to a developer that will give him very actionable fixes and that's something i focused on as well both in right. grad school and at microsoft research all right so let's drill in on your favorite part of the cycle right now which is testing, testing. Yeah. talk about the specific projects you have going on there i know this topic is near and dear to the developer's heart absolutely especially i think i'll just focus on the cloud application Great. testing part of it so i want to kind of reiterate the problems which is you know i want to simply say modern cloud applications are just complex as i said they are built in a very distributed way the runtime the way information flows is very asynchronous because you want to handle a lot of requests at the same time so you have to be careful how you process the information if you don't process them in a consistent way it kind of leads to these really hard to find bugs the class of bugs that we call concurrency bugs okay these are really hard to find and in fact when we go through and talk to some teams and who have faced these problems you know the way they solve these problems they think okay they hit a concurrency bug but the problem is they take hours and hours finding all the combinations of code that could have actually occurred all the permutations all the permutations and combinations that could have come to hit that concurrency bug so that's really hard for developers yeah. so my focus has been how do you go after these hard to find bugs and find them before they are deployed to production because after you hit it it's very hard to find right and if you hit it these are kind of the rare bugs that bring your system down mm. so i also want to point out another hard to find bug which is when you deploy it to the cloud as i said this is a very fault prone environment when you are actually testing your program in your computer none of this is a problem it's a single machine you test all of it everything works you move to the cloud suddenly a service is not available that's it your application is not working anymore for the customers right? right so that's another hard to find bug that you want to predict before it happens so these are kind of sometimes the combination of both okay so we actually built a system that can find these hard to find bugs before a system is deployed to production and before going into the system i also want to talk about how people do that today you tell a team yeah your system is highly concurrent you can hit concurrency bugs how do you find it today there are two extremes on one extreme where people don't put any extra effort is i will put my system in a staging deployment run a lot of stress tests for one week and i'm going to pray and hope that i will hit <laughs> some concurrency bug there right. right some teams also kind of like reroute their part of users traffic to the staging deployment so that they'll find something the coverage is of course very low but in terms of developer effort nothing right i'm just running it for a week and checking what is going on so that's one extreme on the other extreme actually there are very sophisticated tools like tla plus which also actually came out of microsoft research where you model your system you express it in a different language and the language can reason about these two categories of bugs wow. so both these concurrency bugs and fault tolerance bugs the problem there is this is a additional it's like significantly additional effort for the developer right? right which is you have to separately maintain this modeling language as you update your code you have to update the model so there are two extremes now let's see where our project kind of fits so this specific instance of the project actually achieved the best of both worlds which is we make it similarly zero effort for the developer just run your existing test stress test put it in a staging deployment on all of it but we take these sophisticated algorithms that the systematic testing tools like tla plus have and apply it on that environment wow okay so it's kind of the best of both worlds all we say is don't change your behavior all that you are doing is some form of testing do it but do it with our tool yeah and suddenly our tool kind of amplifies your tests to explore all these paths to find what could happen in production so is this still in research or is this no it is it is, is actually it's getting widely deployed in microsoft and we have achieved uh, quite a bit of success in actually finding 
I won't say how many bugs, but like we have found tons of bugs. I mean, like critical bugs that could have happened in production. There's some amazing research projects going on in live video stream analysis. Tell us about your research in this area and what technical challenges are you addressing? What methods are you using to solve them and what results are you seeing? I have like a simple story why I got into it, right? I've been a very developer-focused person. Why did I get into kind of live video stream analysis, right? Two reasons. I think for the last 15 years, analyzing video has fascinated me. You know, since the time we got a webcam at home, and I actually figured out that you can program that webcam to read pixels out of all the images that are coming in. I've been building like all sorts of small applications as like side projects. One of it is, you know, we got a bird feeder at home. And then I set up basically a camera and write a program to say, does a squirrel ever come to the bird feeder, right? So this has been kind of a very fascinating thing for me since I was very young. So that's one reason I have always continued keeping this live video analysis as one of my side projects. The number two thing is, of course, in the last two, three years, computer vision has become mainstream. And in fact, our research community and our team started embracing it because we are systems people. And of course, these are kind of large scale systems that consume a lot of resources. Mm. So we started taking that route. But I got into it again because of the developer perspective that I had, which is, you know, how do I make it extremely easy for developers to build cloud scale computer vision applications? How do you mix and match these things in a certain way so that you can adapt it to your domain? So that's how I got into it. Again, from a very developer centric point of view, but it has taken its own form and it's like we are running with it. So let's talk about one of the best applications of that technology, Hype Zone. Yeah. This is a big thing, yeah. and most of our listeners, if they're gamers, will know all about it already. But what's cool about it? What's different about it? Again, a little bit of a story, how we created the Hype Zone. Uh, I was going into this developer-centric view of, you know, how do you make it extremely easy for developers to build computer vision application? Mm -hmm. And we actually took an instance of it, and we participated in the Microsoft one-week hackathon. There were like 18,000 participants and like 4,000 projects. So we had an instance of it which tackled kind of a specific application and we actually won the grand prize. We, in fact, we pitched this back to wow. Satya. So that is where actually a lot of focus on live video stream analysis for consumers started. So something like Hype Zone is a gaming area, which is a lot to consumers. So once we won the hackathon, of course, there was lots of teams in Microsoft who came back to us and said, you know, Wab, you have a cool technology. We should apply to what we have and see if we can create some really unique experiences. So Hype Zone is actually a set of channels on Mixer. For people who don't know what Mixer is, Mixer is a game streaming platform where people actually stream their gameplay to the entire world. So that's what Mixer is. What is Hype Zone? Hype Zone is actually a set of channels in Mixer that continuously shows you down to the wire interesting games that are going on in Mixer. Like in all the thousands of streams that are in Mixer, what's the most interesting game that is going on right now? So let's take an example game, Fortnite, which is kind of a cultural phenomenon right now. Everybody knows it. Either you are playing it or your kid is playing it. So you take a game like Fortnite. A single game takes like 30 to 45 minutes for people to finish. It's typically kind of the end game that is like super interesting. So how do you analyze all live video streams that are coming into Mixer Finding who is playing that really intense end game and showcase it in a very dedicated channel. This is like the NFL red zone of Fortnite, <laughs> right? And you keep showing it. And this has been like hugely successful, right? People see like interesting content all the time. It's not just about the viewers, by the way. The streamers get so excited getting highlighted on the hype zone. Because if you look at like a platform like Mixer, you have certain celebrities that people follow. And typically these up and coming streamers are not very visible. What the Hype Zone did was, if you're a good gamer, you'll get featured to, you know, thousands of people who will watch you. Right. So streamers get super excited when they get featured on the Hype Zone. So this worked out as a win-win for us. Consumers were so happy because it was interesting content. Streamers were so happy because, you know, they get featured on it. So let's drill in on the technology behind it a little bit, because you talk about the hackathon and... And what goes on there is, like you say, for people who love to 